Bonjour and bienvenue to the podcast you are currently about to listen to. Oh, that kind of rhymed a bit, didn't it? <laughs> my name is Ben, and I'm here to direct you to my podcast, Battle Royale, where my best friend Eliza and I go through all of the kings and emperors of France, from Clovis to Napoleon III. If you're familiar with other podcasts like Rex Factor, Pontifax, or Totalis Rankium, you know the deal. We rank them all based on a number of categories that showcase their various strengths and weaknesses. But the stakes are a bit higher this time. All 71 of our monarchs are locked in a dungeon awaiting our judgment. Those who we deem to be the creme de la creme will go through to the Battle Royale tournament and compete to see who is the most majestic, fabulous, and irresistible despot of them all. Those who do not will be sent to the guillotine. Join our macabre adventure from the Dark Ages to the French Revolution, try to pronounce place names like Reims with us, and help us decide who's ahead and who's headless. Battle Royale French Monarchs. That's Battle Royale colon French Monarchs, wherever you get your podcasts. Gamarjoba, and welcome to the history of Sacadvillo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto. In case you've forgotten over the last few weeks, it was kind of a long break. Now that I have your attention, I do have something I would like to say. We're nearing the one year anniversary of the show on April 17th, 2022. And I would like to use this time to have you submit questions. We'll be doing an Ask Me Anything in April, and I'd like to give you a few weeks to get questions submitted. Get them turned in as soon as possible via email, Twitter, or Facebook. I would also like to thank Trevor Cully from the History of Persia for sending us The Night in the Panther Skin by Shota Rustavelli and The Caucasus, an introduction by Thomas DeWall. Now, back to the show. This is episode 12, Mirdat and Amazas. We last left off with Parsman I's escapades in Armenia, his substantially long reign, the murder of his own son for the sake of keeping his alliance with Rome, as well as the birth of the most important person in the Georgian Chronicles, Jesus Christ. This is our way of reminding you that the Georgian Chronicles were in fact written by monks. In this episode, We'll cover the reigns of Kings Mirdat I and Amazas I, which makes sense, that's the name of the episode, as well as look at some first-hand sources that come to us via tablet inscriptions. This episode includes a very substantial divergence from the Georgian Chronicles, which insists on the existence of a diarchy in this era, which I'll get into during the episode. With Parsman's death in 58 AD, the throne passed to his son Mirdat, who was born from Parsman's second wife. But the chroniclers have something entirely different to say. They instead impose the fact that Parsman divided his realm between his two sons named Bartom and Kartam. We know this to be entirely false, especially with Roman records verifying that Parsman's sons were named Radamist, Mirdat, and Amazasp. Now, I'm going to do something here to help make more sense of things. I'm going to mention that I know that the Chronicles are highly inaccurate with the information they give us, and it doesn't mean they're entirely wrong. Even with their supposed diarchy, we can't say that everything that occurs in the Chronicles didn't exactly happen. We don't have evidence to corroborate against it, and if anything, there are some events that do occur, just in a slightly different order. We need to remember that the Chronicles are a set of writings that were oral histories of the events in Georgia. Much like a game of telephone, and much like Homer's works, things get distorted over time. With the 11th century chronicler Leonti Rovelli writing this down literally centuries afterwards, of course things will be off. Plus, Amazasp is also mentioned in the Chronicles, so it's not like it was completely wrong. I'll cover the facts that we know for certain first to help ease the confusion. According to Narmazi inscription, it suggested that Mirdat was crowned as an infant 
with his mother acting as regent. The most important event during Mirdat's reign is when the Romans and Parthians finally wrote a peace treaty which made Greater Armenia a Parthian vassal and gave Rome the power to approve the kings of Greater Armenia. This ensured peace between the Romans, Parthians, and Iberians, at least for the next 50 years. This peace allowed stability to return to Armenia and to grow as a regional power in the Caucasus. Mirdat would not stay still though. Peace between the Roman and Parthians was fine, but he decided that asserting the strength of Kartli would be even better. He attempted this with the help of an Ossetian alliance. In the 60s, the Dario Pass to the north was opened, and hordes of Ossetian warriors poured through, harassing both the Romans and Parthians. In 72 AD, the Ossetians invaded Armenia. King Tiridat of Armenia met the Ossetians in battle, but was overrun and got a lasso wrapped around his neck. At the last possible moment, he cut the lasso and managed to barely escape his captors. To bring peace between Armenia and the Ossetians, King Tiridat used the oldest trick in the royal handbook. He married the Ossetian princess Satinik. Hey, woman's name. Nice. The famous neckbeard emperor himself, Nero, then invited King Tiridat of Armenia to Rome. That doesn't sound great. While there, Tiridat and Nero planned a campaign against the Ossetians. Doesn't sound great. The campaign turned out to be a massively successful one, and the Armenians were able to drive the Ossetians back over the Kura River, kill the Ossetian kings, and break the Iberian Ossetian alliance. This proved to be a problem for Kartli because it was with the help of the Ossetians that Mirdat was able to take the land south of the Kura River that he had lost to the invading Armenian forces. However, things at the court in Mitesketa were not going well. Mirdat supposedly wanted to continue driving his forces even further into Armenia, but the pro-Armenian Aristavi, or our Georgian nobles, were having none of that and they managed to discourage the thought of any further ventures into Armenia because they are killjoys. At this point, it's 75 AD and Nero's gone from Rome and we now have Emperor Vespasian. Vespasian thought it best to prevent any further ascetting incursions into the region and set Roman legionaries to fortify the fortress at Armazi. The nice thing about this is that these legionaries decided to leave an inscription at the Armazi fortress which could be found next to the Kura River. It reads as such. Imperator Caesar Vespasianus Augustus, Pontifex Maximus, holding the tribunician power for the seventh time, Imperator for the fourteenth time, Consul for the sixth time, and designated for the seventh, Father of the Fatherland, Censor and Imperator, Titus Caesar, son of Augustus, holding the tribunician power for the fifth time, Consul for the fourth time, and designated for the fifth, Censor and Domitianus Caesar, son of Augustus, consul for the third time and designated for the fourth. For the king of the Iberians, Mithridates, son of King Parismanus, and Amazaspus, friend of Caesar and of the Romans, and for his people, they fortified the walls. While we're on the topic of inscriptions, there was a stela found at the Armazi necropolis, written by the viceroy of the region named Shargas, which praises the military triumphs of Mirdat, of which Shargas was able to take part of. Shargas gives us first-hand knowledge of the court in Mitesheta, and I, for one, love this, mostly because it gives us the name of an actual person who was part of the court. Strabo, our favorite geographer, mentions the institutions of the Iberian kingdom in his writing and states that there is a second ruler of royal lineage who dispenses justice and commands the army. Well, we know there's no second ruler because the Iberian diarchy is non-existent. But what Strabo neglects to mention is some etymological facts. The Aramaic word for Shardagas' position is pitiachsh. There is a term in Middle Persian, bidax, which is derived from the Old Persian dvitiachsaya, which means second ruler or viceroy, which would fit Strabo's description perfectly. I'd like to remind you that at this point in time, the government of Kartli still very much resembled the Persian form of government. I will also be reading the inscription's translation, but keep in mind that there may be some things that don't make sense, but it's self-explanatory that Shargas is being Mirdat's hype man, and of course, placing himself in the battle. Some things don't translate well from the Aramaic, so we're trying our best there with the locations and names, and honestly, it's hard to figure them out to begin with. The king is Mirdat, the great king. Son of Parzman, the great king. I am Shargas, son of Zewa the elder. I. 
Shargas, am also Pityaxius of King Mirdat. My domains are also the domain of kingship, who is thus established in Metit. The Naxudat has gone, or the tax Naxudat is levied at Metit. This charge applies thus to the sources of waters and to people and to buildings and, in the same way, to anyone belonging to the domain of the kingship. I, the Pityaxis Sargas, in front of the city, I tear down the fortress. King Mirdat was in front of the bordering land, and with my help he entered into Armenia, conquered one blank. He destroyed the fort of Tibit, and there were three feet of arms. King, this is Metit, and thus in the midst of the domain, the army stood in place of this blank, they don't know, at the gate below the top of the mountain, and thus the rest remaining, living or normal, or citadel that resigned before Miskneet, Moshians or the Masagatai, was in the fortress of Snirt, which is the bordering territory, and Udit, belonging to the place at Klit. The good fortune is again established in the fortress over Metit. He took again the quit certainly under this place, and thus he ordered to me that I, Shargas, complete before Miskit the fortress of heroes. The heart was with the tranquility during the troubles, and certainly he commanded a brilliant feat of arms, literally the feat of arms in the brilliance. Certainly, Mitit, Shargas, the cursed house of Asparug is without lord, his statue was burnt, three great exploits were accomplished. Mirdat hardly ever cartly experienced peace and was consistently fighting with the Armenians during the rest of his reign. That is something that will continue to happen for most of history. At one point during these conflicts, the Iberian army managed to capture an Armenian general and imprison him in the Dario Gorge. And at another point, the Armenians even managed to occupy the capital of Mitiskieta, thus forcing the Iberian troops to withdraw from the Armenian borderlands. However, these conflicts culminated with an Armenian defeat at the town of Javakieti, which saw the Iberians regain the borderlands around the town and the fortress at Sunda. This ended up bringing peace between Kartli and Armenia, but what about the Alans to the north? Well, the chroniclers talk about a set of raids by the Alans occurring during the 70s. This is backed up by the historian Josephus in his book of the Jewish Wars, in which he mentions that the Parthians and Armenians fought against a group of Alans that had come through the Iron Gates of Alexander, which is just another name for the Dario Pass. These line up with the attacks by the Ossetians, but who knows what was going on in this period. We're not exactly doing great with sources here. Honestly, we're not sure. Some sources I've read say that the Ossetians were also Alans, and Alani is right on the Dario Pass, so for the sake of this podcast, I'm going to keep calling them Ossetians. With all of these conflicts resolved between the Caucasian powers, what did the Romans have to say about these events? We're not exactly sure. There's a Latin inscription about 45 miles west of Baku, Azerbaijan, that places a Roman legion in Caucasian Albania at least after 84 AD. If the Romans were assisting Kartli against the Caucasian Albanians, this may have been done in secret since Rome was officially allied to both nations. No real war came between Iberia and Caucasian Albania until at least 130 AD. And then Mirdat passed away in 106 AD and was succeeded by his son Amazas, or brother, depending on some sources. We're not done with Mirdat just yet, as we need to go over the events as reflected in the Georgian Chronicles. I honestly don't want to change the rulership of every king that the chroniclers make up, so we're going on the assumption that this is all happening under Mirdat. But we're still going to change him anyways. The biggest giveaway that none of this is right is that the kings of the diarchy are conveniently reported to have ruled and died at the exact same time. Like, how is that even possible? So, Mirdat will supposedly have done all of this for the sake of our narrative. I will be using the same name of the supposed rulers the chroniclers mention for the sake of keeping the historical value of the chronicles intact. The chronicles start off with the reign of Bartholm and Kartam. They mention the destruction of Jerusalem by Emperor Vespasian, and talk about how the Jews of Jerusalem fled from the city, and made their way to Mitiskieta to settle in the Jewish sector of the city. And among these refugees, were the descendants of the sons of Barabbas, the man who was freed at the crucifixion instead of Jesus Christ. During this time, Bartob and Kartam ruled in mutual love and they had each one son who stood to inherit their thrones. Their rule ended peacefully and power soon passed to Kaos and Parzban. This just looks like they had the wrong name for Parzban in the chronicles, Arki or Rok, and decided that since they had a second Parzban, they needed a first instead of going back and correcting the actual name of our last king. During Kaos's and Parzman's 
reign, the chroniclers decide that Armenia is reigning over the Georgians, including the king in charge of the Armazi region of Georgia, being Parzman. Parzman supported the Armenians wholeheartedly whenever they went off to fight, but this relationship was cancelled by the supposed Armenian king Erdvand, who was non-existent anywhere else. He attacked Parzman's borders and took the region of Tsunda, which stretches from the Armenian border to the Mitkvadi River. King Erdvand settled a tribe of devils in this region and named it the Sunda Kajatuni, or House of Devils. Kaos would not lift a finger to help his cousin, and Parzman was unable to fight back. They both died at the same time somehow, and Parzman's son Azork and Chaos's son Arbazel took over their respective thrones. Like, this is the complete opposite of Parzman. How? And this is when the Chronicles get somewhat fun with the battles and the exploits of Arzok and Armazel. Reminder, we are still under the reign of Mirdat, and some of these events will line up with what was mentioned in the historical section for Mirdat. Azork and Armazel noticed that their fathers did not get along at all, and decided to cooperate to restore the borders that their bickering of the fathers had destroyed. Off in Armenia, King Ervan was killed by a man named Sumbat Vivritian, who then placed his brother Artashan onto the Armenian throne. The kings of Kartli, Azork and Armazel caught on the Ossetians and Leki tribe for help and invited the king of the Ossetians, two men of apparently giant stature named Bazuk and Ambazuk, to join them. Real original naming there. They brought their army, along with the Pechenegs and Jeeks, while the king of the Lekis brought the Chechens and Dadoians. This is the first time we've heard about the Chechens in quite a while, by the way. Anyways, now seeing their allies gathered and prepared for war, Azork and Armazel gathered their troops in countless numbers, hiding their plans in secrecy so the Armenians wouldn't be aware of the attack they were planning. The day soon arrived and the Iberian forces and their allies stealthily crossed the Armenian borders and ravaged the land from Shirakun and Vanan down to Bagravan and Bastiani. Soon they turned back to devastate the towns of Dash down to Nakchevan and took with them countless prisoners and spoils of war. Sumbat Bivritian would not look favorably on the sloss of face of Armenia and gathered his Armenian troops and rushed to meet the Iberians and their allies. Sumbat started to pester the Iberian troops and their allies after they had crossed the Mikvadi River and camped along the banks of the Yori River. The Armenians found the Iberians dividing the captives and loot they had taken. Sumbat decided to play the diplomatic game first. He sent an envoy with the following message, I leave to you all the spoils you have taken from Armenia, the cattle, gold, silver and cloth. I also do not look for compensation for the Armenian blood you have shed, but let the prisoners go and leave in peace, enriched and filled with everything. The Iberians and their allies decided to not take this deal of the century and instead responded with their own counteroffer. We came to Armenia for no other thing but you, though we could not find you. Now come, do not refuse, for wherever you go, we will come for you, and you will not escape us alive. I'm pretty sure the only thing that Sumbat was having when he heard this message was the darned audacity of these Iberians. So, what else was Sumbat to do than show the Iberians what was what? Sumbat crossed the Bikvadi River and came to the Iberian camp. Camp. Bazuk, king of the Ossetians, sent an envoy to Sumbat to propose a single combat challenge. Sumbat agreed and readied himself. With his Armenian troops behind him, Sumbat rode up on his horse and prepared for battle. In a flash, Bazuk rushed out with his horse. Sumbat reacted with his own quickness. Battle cries filled the air as they rushed to each other with spears in their hands. What happened next shocked the whole camp. Sumbat moved his spear in low and impaled Bazuk through the waist, the spear sticking a whole foot and a half out from his back. Using the momentum from his charge, Sumbat moved the spear with a flick of the wrist and pushed Bazuk's body off of the horse and pinned him into the ground. Sumbat was victorious. Anbazuk, Bazuk's brother and the other king of the Ossetians, rushed to aid his brother. He saw that the lifeblood had left his brother and became enraged. He picked up his own spear to attack Sumbat. Sumbat was faster though and recovered his spear in time to impale Anbazuk as well. Anbazuk fell to the ground and Sumbat towered over both bodies. He looked over to the Ossetian army and said, This is for the Armenian women, men, and babies you have killed. Literal goosebumps. Sumbat is badass. Kind of weird how all the important figures in Georgian history always have dramatic encounters on the battlefield, though. The troops of the Asakians, Lekis, Iberians, and the other northern tribes cried out in anger at the death of Bazuk and Anbazuk. 
They were so embittered against the Armenians that they rallied to the Iberian kings, Azork and Armazel, and attacked Sumbat and the Armenian troops. The battle was intense, lasting for six hours. The air was heavy with the kicked up dust, and what little sunlight came through the clouds soon faded as night came around. With the sun gone, and the cloud lingering, the fighters could not discern friend from foe. There were countless dead on both sides. At the same time, the camp of the northern tribes were routed by the Armenians. Sumbat, despite being heavily wounded from the battle, began pursuing the northern tribes and chased them until nightfall. He destroyed the Ossetian and Leki armies, leaving few alive. The Iberians managed to escape thanks to their knowledge of the local terrain. Azork and Armazel also sustained wounds from the battle and withdrew to Mitisketa for shelter. Suma Bivritian's revenge was not yet complete. Just as the Iberians had devastated the lands of Armenia and killed Armenian men, women, and babes, he'd do the same to Kartli. Sumat entered into Kartli and began to destroy everything outside the safety of fortresses and towns. Sumat ignored these reinforced locations for the simple fact that he had nothing prepared for siege warfare, thanks to the quickness of the Iberian attacks and how he needed to respond to them then and there. Instead, Suma began building a fortress on Mount Gado, now called Samtske. He left a garrison there to aid the inhabitants of the Sunda region in their struggle with the Orzokhevians and then left. In the town of Orzoka, where the Orzokhevians reside, there lived one Aristavi of King Armazel, who was of the Aznauri rank. If you remember, the Aznauris were the ones who helped King Parnavaz and rebelled against Azo. They were the Greek soldiers who were there and was entirely devoted to Armazel. He was aided by the Megrelians. The Tsundians and Demotians aided each other, causing the war to continue with no end, and the Aznauri soon battled the Armenian allies at the Noste River. In Klarjeti, an Aznauri of King Azork inflicted harm against the Armenians at their border in an area called Tau. Tau is important to Georgia in the next few centuries. Remember this region. The Aznauri was very lucky, since no enemy could enter Klarjeti thanks to the thick forest and rocky landscapes that surround it. It also helped that the Klarjetians were skilled soldiers and horsemen. Azork and Armazel, in turn, reinforced their fortresses in towns like almost all Iberian kings do. They did not want to give in to their fear of the Armenian troops. Their plans ruined thanks to their destroyed alliances. Their fight against the Armenians continued. Soon enough, the Ossetians managed to recover their forces and wanted to avenge their fallen kings. They passed through the Dario Pass once more and allied themselves with Kartli. The Ossetians continued fighting against the Armenians to no end. The kings of Kartli soon took the fight back to the Armenians and headed from Mitisketa to Abotsi. The Iberians were in continuous battle with the Armenians. Then, King Artashan of the Armenians decided to set out with his forces and Sumbat Bivritian. The Iberians reinforced their towns and fortresses and added the Ossetian allies to their garrisons. But the Armenian force instead marched directly to Mitisketa. The battle lasted for five months, and instead of having a set-piece battle, they had a series of single combat challenges. Things did not go well for the Iberians and Ossetians, and they struggled against the Armenians. The Iberians appealed for peace and promised to not look for revenge or to even restore their borders. Artashan agreed to the terms and forced the Iberians and Ossetians under his rule. Years passed, and Kartli was continuously ravaged by the Armenians for their transgression years earlier. Things began to change when the Iberians and Ossetians noticed that Armenia had become rather preoccupied with the war between the Romans and Parthians. Seeing a chance to escape from the Armenian yoke, the Iberians and Ossetians banded their forces together once more and began launching raids back into Armenia. They were aided by the fact that Artashan's two sons and Sumba Bivritian were off fighting the Parthians. Once the raiding by the Iberian Ossetian alliance had caused more than enough damage, Artashan gathered troops and placed one of his sons, Zeren, in charge of fighting the Iberian alliance. The United Iberian forces met with the Armenians in Javakheti and battled them there. The Iberians proved victorious over the Armenians, and Zeren, 
son of King Artashan, was captured when his army was routed and destroyed on the banks of Lake Tseli. The Ossetians wanted to kill Zarin as revenge for the deaths of Kings Bazuk and Anbazuk, but the Iberians had a better ear for diplomacy and convinced the Ossetians to instead use Zarin as leverage for land. Zarin was then imprisoned at the fortress of Darialan or the Dario Pass. The Armenians could not respond to the Iberian demands since they were occupied with the Parthians. They were at a diplomatic standstill for three years, and Sumbat Bivritian came with Artavaz and Tigran, Zarin's brothers, and the rest of the Armenian army. Azork and Armazel ordered their troops to take cover in the reinforced towns, fortresses, and even in the mountains. The Armenians made camp at Trialeti, and both sides decided to send envoys before battle. This led to a series of peace talks in which the Iberians returned Prince Zarin to the Armenians and promised to aid the Armenians by sending horsemen and minting coins in the image of King Artashan. In exchange, the Armenians would return the borderland regions to Iberia namely the region of Tsunda, the fortress of the Moti, or Tsamskir, Javakheti, and Artaani. After these talks concluded, the Armenians, Iberians, and Ossetians lived in mutual love and fought together against their enemies. Azork and Armazel were relieved at having regained the frontiers that their fathers had lost and soon died. They were succeeded by their sons Amazasp and Derok. Amazasp took Armazi and Derok took Inarkartli. So, now that we have finished the epic retelling of the Georgian Chronicles, you can see how some events line up with the history of Mirdat that we know, and how much does not. The Iberians were never under the yoke of the Armenians, at least during this time period, and there was no King Artashan, no Sumbat, or any of those three princes. One thing to remember is that it is likely that a general was captured and taken to the Dario Pass, and that this fight against the Ossetians may have included some Iberian forces, since it was a land grab by Mirdat. The Roman Armenian campaign against the Ossetians did kill Ossetian kings, and there was a battle of Javakheti that ended with an Iberian victory. So, the chronicles aren't all that wrong, but the main fact is that there are names and people who aren't confirmed, especially when we can confirm the names of the Armenian rulers. Now, I'm a bit livid that Sumat Biritian is not a real person because he sounds amazing, and I'd love to see a comic or a movie with him in it. But that's all about Mirdat, and well, he did do substantially more. We hit 106 AD, and it's time for Amazasp to take the throne. This is a short one. Amazasp ruled from 106 to 116 AD. In the Georgian Chronicles, this is what they have to say. Quote, After them, Amazasp and Derok, reigned their sons Parzman the Valiant in Armazi and Mirdat in the inner city. End quote. And what do contemporary sources have to say about Amazasp? We know for sure that there was no Derok, but Amazasp remains more of a source of confusion than of clarity. There is a chance he was Mirdat's brother, but there's also a chance he was Mirdat's son. There is an epigram in Rome, suitably titled, The Epigram of Amazasp, that goes over the death of Amazasp. I personally find this source confusing, because we really only have this epigram telling us anything of value outside of the chronicles. The epitaph reads as such. The illustrious king's son Amazaspos, the brother of King Mithridates, whose native land lies by the Caspian gates, Iberian, son of Iberian, is buried here. By the sacred city which Nikator built, around the olive-nurturing stream of Migdon, he died, companion to the Ausonian leader, going for the lord to Parthian battle. Yet before he had splattered his hand with enemy gore, mighty the hand, alas, with spear and bow, and with the sword blade, on foot and on horse, and he himself the peer of modest maidens. The illustrious king is, of course, Parsman. Trajan's victory against the Parthians made Armenia a Roman province and then a kingdom dependent on Rome under the Arshakid dynasty. For now, Armenia was harmless to Kartli. Parthia was also quite harmless, thanks to their peace with Rome for the next 45 years. Amazas was succeeded by his son, Parsman II the Valiant, in 117 AD. Join us next time as we cover the reign of King Parsman II the Valiant and we get more of a look at court life. Remember to submit questions for the AMA in April for our first year anniversary. I can't wait to see what questions you all come up with. To support us, feel free to look us up on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as The History of Sacadvelo, Georgia, on Twitter at History underscore Georgia, on our website at historyofsacadvelo.com, or on our email at thehistoryofsacadvelogeorgia at gmail.com. Sacadvelo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R, 
T-V-E-L-O. If you would be so kind in aiding with purchasing sources, I have a link to the Amazon wishlist in a transcription on the website, but it's only if you want to. Also, a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madlaba da Nakbamdis. And thank you for listening to The History of Sacrevelo, Georgia. See you next time.